The date is July 26, 2023, and a week ago, we, Betty and I were in Minnesota, and uh, when we were visiting Greg and Ruth, uh, Greg took me out to the garage and said, I want to show you some records, 33 and a third records that have been in storage here for a long time, and I don't have a record player, and could you... Would you like these? And I said, well, I don't want to keep them, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I will uh, take them and record. Yeah, I have a record player, and I'll record them on some method, and then I will let you have the recordings of them, and then I'll give you the records back, back to later. So here's the one I decided to record first. This is, I thought, kind of a strange record. It's called 10 Ways to Take Strokes Off Your Game. Now, it's a golf game. Learning, this was 1967, right? Been a while. And uh, the concept of learning to play golf by listening to a record, I, I thought was eh, a little strange. So I thought that'd be great. That's kind of matches my personality. So I recorded it and uh, what you're gonna see now uh, or listen to uh, and see is the cover and then the, the, the back of the cover that gives the table of contents or whatever you call it. So that's what this is. Uh, you can stop it whenever you get bored. But there are some good things in this. I think you'll like it in a way if you're a golfer. I think you'll enjoy it because it does uh, give some good tips by golfers who have been long gone off the scene. I mean, uh, just as an example of who I'm talking about, Billy Casper. Been a while. Ray Floyd, yeah, a long time ago. Frank Beard. So you'll you'll hear their voices. Actually, uh, you'll find it interesting too because the the conversation with the interviewer is very stilted, you know. But they're not professional speakers. But boy, they're they were great golfers in their day. All right, enough of me. Here it is. 10 ways to take something off something. Here it is. A long straight shot right down the middle of the fairway. You know, that's what this game of golf is all about, whether you're a pro or strictly a Sunday golfer. Actually, it's a funny thing about golf. The difference between a good round and a poor round is often just a matter of one or two bad shots. But boy, if you repeat these same mistakes on a few holes, well, simple arithmetic will tell the story. Munsing wear, the golf shirt people, would like to see you get more enjoyment from your game. This is why we have called together 10 of golf's leading players from the Munsing wear Advisory Committee. I'm hoping that the men who wear the Munsing wear Penguin can help solve your golf problems, whatever they might be. They certainly should be able to, for every one of them is a champion. Their combined winnings for a single year have reached as high as half a million dollars. Okay, to get started right, we've asked Frank Beard, the New Orleans Open champion, to join us on the practice tee. Frank, suppose we talk about the basics, the grip and the stance. Be glad to, Dal. I understand your father started you on the game when he was a professional in Dallas, Texas. That's right. Well, he certainly did a right job by you. Tell us about the grip you used when you won the New Orleans Open. Like most golfers, Dal, I favor the Varden or overlapping grip. It seems to work best for me. That's what I use too, Frank. What are the checkpoints you use to make sure your grip is correct? Well, first I check my palms. Are they facing each other? Then I check my fingers. It's the little finger of the right hand riding over the index finger of the left. And the V's formed by my thumb and forefinger. Are they aimed at a point between my chin and my right shoulder? Looking at my hands, I see just the first three knuckles of the left hand. Suppose a player has a chronic slice. Is there any correction he can make in the grip to cure it? There sure is. If a person is slicing habitually, he may be able to solve the problem by moving his whole grip more to the right. That is to say the V's are further to the right or over his right shoulder. And for a hook, would it be just the reverse? Exactly. If you're having a hooking problem, move both of your hands more to the left. So maybe all you'll see will be about two knuckles on the left hand. 
In other words, to correct a hook or a slice, you have to exaggerate the grip a little. How about the feel of the club? For me, the important pressure points are in the last three fingers of the left hand. They should hang on fairly tight, not rigid, but firm. In the right hand, I apply more pressure to the thumb and first finger, as they are the controls of my right hand on the shaft. Do you ever recommend a grip other than the Varden? Yes, I do, Dow. The interlocking grip can be a good thing for someone who has very small or weak hands. The little finger of the right hand hooks around the left index finger. Then there's the so-called baseball grip, as used by a few players on the tour. It's actually the same as the Varden, except that the little finger of the right hand does not overlap. All ten fingers grip the club. Suppose you had one warning flag to raise on the subject of the grip. What would it be? That's easy. Don't loosen up. At no time during the swing should your hands ever lose their grip on the club. That's particularly important to remember at the top of the swing, where the tendency is to let go. Good. So much for the grip. Now how about a few pointers on the stance? Okay, Dow. First of all, I'd say it's essential to be comfortable. If you feel awkward or tense, you're never going to be able to hit the ball. Always keep the knees flexed, as if you were about to sit down on a small stool. Stand fairly straight, not bent way over the ball, and the weight evenly balanced on both feet keeping them about as far apart as the width of the shoulders. Well, that's for the woods and long irons, isn't it, Frank? That's right. Your stance gets more narrow as your clubs get shorter. But you're going to cover that later on, aren't you, Dow? Sure thing. We'll stick to the basics now. As a starter, I'd say that I'm an advocate of the square stance for the average golfer. By this, I mean that you keep both feet parallel to the line of flight. However, for your longer woods or stronger players... I would advocate a closed stance, or drawing the right foot back from the line of flight. This gives the player a freer turn on the ball and gives his release into the ball an inside-out swing. Well, Frank, we're off to a fine start. Thanks a lot for your help. Let's go to the Champions Country Club in Houston, Texas, where Bobby Nichols is competing in the Houston International Golf Championship. We've asked Bobby, a former PGA champion, to discuss driving because he's probably one of the longest drivers in the game today. Hey, thanks for the compliment, Dale. You know, Bobby, you've heard the story about putting for dough and driving for show. But without a good drive, and by that I mean with accuracy and distance, you don't reach the green in time to get to putt for the dough. So actually, the drive itself is for dough, too. I agree with you, Dale. Besides, if you can drive the ball well... You're going to have confidence in yourself, and that makes the whole game easier. Bobby, I'm sure you remember, but one of the most memorable drives in my mind, anyway, is the one you hit in the Carling World Championship in Detroit. As I recall, you were one stroke ahead going to the last hole, and in order to preserve your lead, you had to have a perfect drive. Well, as I remember, that drive must have been well, at least 300 yards. Somewhere around that. Well, I know it was in dead center of the fairway, and it puts you in a perfect position to win that championship. Sometimes you get a little lucky, you know. I think that was a little more than luck, Bobby. Tell us what you concentrated on, to just to put that drive in the middle of the fairway and with that much distance. Well, it's hard to remember an individual shot, but I usually just set the club down, line up my feet, and think about hitting the ball as solid in the middle of the club face as I possibly can. What are the basic things that you think most golfers ought to concentrate on when they step on the tee? First of all, let's review the swing. I think you should tee the ball up so that half the ball is above the club head. Position the ball just off the left heel. My weight is evenly distributed on both feet. My arms hang naturally so they reach the ball easily without stretching. We just covered the stance with Frank Beard. Now how do you feel about the square versus a close stance for driving. I think the average player gets a little more turn on the backswing by taking a slightly closed stance. I suppose at this point, we should say something about keeping the eye on the ball. That's a classic reminder teaching pros are most famous for. That's true, but actually it's a matter of keeping the head steady. You can keep your eye on the ball and still be guilty of bobbing your head up and down or from side to side. Okay, now how about the swing itself? We're not ready for that yet. First comes the waggle. Are you serious about that? I sure am. 
Tension is a golfer's worst enemy, whether you loosen up with a forward press or a waggle. Don't just stand there. Do something. Now can we talk about the swing? Sure thing. The backswing should be started all in one piece. The knees, hips, arms, shoulders, the whole left side turning away from the ball. Drag the club on the ground in a straight line, slowly, oh, about six to eight inches. Your weight shifts to the right side on the backswing. When you reach the top of the backswing, the shoulders will have made a full turn. Your back is facing the target and your left shoulder is under your chin. The club should be pointing at the target. Now, what happens on the downswing? The first thing is to get the weight back to the left side. The shifting of the weight will start the club down in an inside-out position with the wrist still cocked. The left side has to turn out of the way, but it shouldn't collapse. How about balance, Bobby? Do you want to touch on that? Absolutely, Dal. Without good balance, especially on the follow-through, you're not going to be able to hit the ball well. I see people swing at the ball, and after they've hit it, they're practically falling down. You should finish a good shot with most of your weight on the left side, your right shoulder underneath your chin, and your hands high. The test is, can you hold that position as long as you want without falling forward or back on your heels? That's balance. And that's a good point to close on. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks for your help. And now for some tips on iron play from the man who is said to look like the human one iron, Al Guyberger. Is it true, Al, that you owe your 1966 PGA championship to peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Well, Dal, I hope not entirely, but they do give me energy. Oh, Al, I thought you were going to say they give you iron. Al, what pointers can you give us on irons? Hit your irons for accuracy and not for distance. Don't try and hit them hard. If I had one rule, that would be it. If I had a second rule, it would be don't be afraid of your irons. The average golfer tenses up the minute he gets a two iron or a three iron in his hand, and the result is often disaster. Have you noticed how often golfers try to scoop the ball with an iron instead of letting the natural loft of the club head get it in the air? That's right. It isn't necessary to lift the ball. If you hit it properly, the club head will do the work for you. What would you say is the secret to good action with an iron? You've got to hit down on the ball, down and through. What happens when a golfer, in an effort to hit down on the ball, catches the turf first? This is what is called a fat shot. When you hit a fat shot, you lose considerable distance. This is one of the big problems of the average player. Try not to swing from the top of your swing. You're probably releasing from the top and not saving your energy until the hitting area. And also remember to shift your weight at the start of your downswing to your left side. Well, how about your swing, Al? Well, Dal... I know we started talking about the 5-iron, but let me say this. I don't think there's any basic difference between hitting a 5-iron or an 8-iron or even a 2-iron. I swing long irons with the same tempo I use on the short. I let the length of the shaft determine the momentum. When you try to swing harder with the long irons, you will lose control of the club and produce a bad shot. We haven't mentioned the shank yet. That's almost a dirty word. It's one of the worst shots a player can hit. It happens when the club face comes into the ball at such an angle that the shank of the club actually hits the ball first. And the cause? There can be a number of causes for a shank. You might be moving forward as you start your downswing. This puts your body ahead of the ball. Then the club has no chance to come through. Or your balance may be poor with your weight too much on your toes. A cure for this is to bend your knees slightly, which will lower your center of gravity and give you a better foundation. That's enough, Al, or we'll make this game sound too tough. There is just one more thing I wish you'd touch on, though, and that's the iron shot that must be played unusually low or unusually high because of some obstruction in your way. Well, to play a low shot, I move more of my weight to my left leg when I address the ball, and I move the ball back of center. Then I swing a little easier and try and come into the ball with firm wrist. And to hit it high. I'll move the ball forward of center, and if the lie is good, my weight will be pretty equally balanced. By moving the ball forward, I'll be able to catch it slightly on the upswing. This will give me the height I need to get it over a trap, a tree, or whatever might be in the way. These are all good tips, Al, but just one more thing. What's that, Dal? Could I have the other half of your peanut butter and jelly sandwich? <laughs> okay.
this point, we'd like to welcome Tommy Jacobs, a past vice president of the PGA, former chairman of the PGA Tournament Committee, and a great pro golfer. Tommy, it seems no matter what subject we're discussing, the grip, the stance, the driver, the problems of hooking and slicing always come up. That's understandable, Dal. They're either a golfer's best friend or his worst enemy. I think I'd know how you'd vote, Tommy. I remember when you were in the sudden death playoff for the Bob Hope Desert Classic, and you hit your drive on the first extra hole behind one of the desert palms. That could have been the end of the road, but you played a beautiful, intentional hook around the tree and won the championship. How do you play a hook like that? I do two things, Dal, and they have to do with the subjects you've already covered, grip and stance. Yes, but they bear repeating. Well, in order to hook, I close my stance by withdrawing the right foot from the intended line of flight. I also change my grip a little bit. I move both my hands more toward the right side of the grip. This allows my hands to roll over as I come into the ball. That closes the club face, which in turn imparts a right to left spin on the ball and makes the ball curve toward the left. I've noticed that when a hook or a slice gets us into trouble, it usually takes another hook or slice to get us out of it. That's about it, Dal. What about the intentional slice? It's just the reverse of what you do to hook the ball. Open the stance and move both hands over to the left side of the shaft. I may move the ball a little bit further back toward my right foot in order to hook. And the opposite to slice or fade the ball. An easy rule to remember is this. All hooks must start to the right and slices to the left. That's good. You've told us how to handle the intentional hook and slice... But how about us fellows who hook and slice when we don't want to? What can be done short of taking up tennis? Well, Dow, let's start with the hardest one, the slice. Uncocking the wrist too early in the downswing could be one cause. Not shifting the weight back to your left side at the start of the downswing is another. This is such a common problem, Tommy. Maybe we'd better say that again. Okay, I will. You always have to start your downswing with a definite shift of the weight from the right to the left side. Otherwise, you're going to set into motion the outside-in type of swing that produces a slice. Or, if you have trouble hooking the ball, you may be hitting the ball from the inside out too much. Actually, the best advice I can give to you is take your hooking and slicing problems to a PGA pro and get them straightened out on a practice tee. Well, that's a good suggestion, Tommy. And lots of luck to you on the tour. Much obliged, Dal. And now a visit to the Selva Marina Country Club in Jacksonville, Florida, to spend a few minutes with Dan Sykes. Dan, I'd like to get your ideas on playing difficult lies, particularly the uphill and downhill ones. I know the way you handled some of these tricky lies in Cleveland Open was a big factor in your winning that tournament. It might have been, Dal, and luckily I was able to play them that week and do pretty well at it. Basically, the idea is this. Whenever you have a downhill or an uphill lie, you should move the ball toward whichever foot is uphill. For example, on an uphill lie, the ball should be moved toward the left foot, and on a downhill lie, it should be moved toward the right foot. What is the principle involved here, Dan? The principle is that it lets you hit the ball at the bottom of the swing without hitting the hill first. When you're playing an uphill shot, do you have any particular feeling about your weight distribution? Well, since most of my weight is just naturally going to lean toward my right or downhill foot, I try to make sure that I have a real firm stance in the grass so I won't slip during the swing. I've noticed that most good players take a little more time in the preparation for this shot, or they might even take an extra practice swing just to get the feel of the club moving along the angle of the slope. Right, Dal. I think it's mainly a matter of balance. If you can swing the club and keep your balance, you're going to have a good shot. You can't quit on this shot either, so you must keep the club head moving. I might also mention that when you're hitting the ball from an uphill lie, the ball will tend to go a little higher, so you must take a less lofted club. Naturally, the reverse is true on a downhill lie. The ball will have a lower flight, so you must take a club with more loft. Dan, I'm sure you'd agree that on an uphill lie, there's a tendency to pull the ball. How do you keep from hitting the ball too far to the left? The simplest and most effective way is just to aim a little more to the right and allow for the pull. Then for a downhill shot, where you normally would push the ball a little to the right, you aim a little to the left of target? Yes, I do. 
And when I have a side hill lie where the ball is below my feet, then I aim more to the left. And how about when the ball is higher than your feet? Then I aim more to the right than I normally would. Do you make any adjustments in your grip? I don't recommend it. I feel it's just too complicated for the average golfer to adjust his grip and adapt his stance at the same time. If the ball is above my feet and I'm standing below it, I do choke down on the club. Also, when the ball is below my feet and I have a tendency to fall forward as I swing the club, I address the ball more toward the toe of the club. You know, Dan, another shot that players frequently have trouble with is when the ball comes to rest in a divot that some thoughtless golfer has failed to replace. When something like that happens, the first thing that goes through my mind is not to gamble too much, but rather to play the shot safe. I usually play the ball more toward the right foot, so my hands are well ahead of the ball, keeping more weight on the left foot. I have to make more of a descending blow on the ball in order to get it out of the divot. The shot will come out a little lower than normal, won't it? Yes, it will, and you'll have to allow for quite a bit of run. You know everyone gets a tough lie once in a while, and it's good to know how to handle them. How about hard pan or baked dirt? Now, there's one problem that really scares most weekend golfers. The big mistake is in trying to use a wedge which has a tendency to bounce off the hard dirt and into the ball. I think that the 9-iron is the club to use here. There's a better chance of getting the ball into the air with the 9-iron. There again, I play the ball more toward the right foot with a little more weight on the left leg and keep the wrist very firm. The main thing with a bad lie is to get the ball out of it. Sacrifice distance if you have to, but use the club that will put you back onto the fairway and in play. Good advice, Dan, and thanks a lot for your help. When in doubt, wedge it out. That's a quote from Bob Golby, the next player to step to our practice tee. You know a man who has won as many championships and been a Ryder Cup player as Bob Golby has been must be an authority with all clubs. Robert, I consider you a master with a wedge, though. I appreciate the compliment, Dow. The fact is, the wedge is a mighty good club to become proficient with. Wouldn't you say that during the past 20 years, the wedge has revolutionized scoring as much as any change in the game? Absolutely, Dow. The wedge is a great club and can save you a lot of strokes if you learn to use it correctly. How about a few pointers? Well, Bob, that's what you're here for. All right, Dow, here goes. Your stance with the wedge should be open and narrow. Weight more on the left leg and your hand somewhat ahead of the ball. For a normal wedge shot, the ball would be mid-weight between your feet. I don't use much body action with the wedge. It's mostly wrist and arm action. The wedge has a good deal of loft, which gets the ball up in the air very quickly without the player trying to help it, and lands on the green with enough backspin to make it stop quickly. How long is the swing? Compared to the other clubs, very short. I swing the wedge back far enough for the left arm to cover the penguin on my shirt. Now, when are you most likely to reach for the wedge? When I get the ball in the tall rough or off the fairway in the trees. Times like that, the wedge is a mighty useful weapon. I may sacrifice a stroke, but if I have to get the ball back onto the fairway and in play again... I'll use the wedge to hack my way out of the jungle. Or if there's a hazard in the way, the wedge has the loft necessary to get over it. Is that right? That's right. The wedge is a very versatile club and accurate, too. Bob, how about the wedge as a pitching club to be used, say, 15 or 20 yards off the green? How would you play that shot? Well, I take the wedge, choke down two or three inches more than I normally would, keep my head down and swing with a sharp descending blow. By choking down on the club, you restrict the back swing and the follow-through? Yes, basically it's all the same swing. Just restrict the power, and don't let your left heel leave the ground. The ball should get up into the air, land close to the pin, and stop pretty fast if it's hit correctly. And that's important, because if the green is elevated, or guarded by a sand trap, or even a water hazard, it's almost impossible to roll the ball onto the green. In a case like that, you must use a club that has some loft. Actually, the wedge has about four or five degrees more loft than a normal nine iron, so the ball will rise quicker, descend sharper, and stop sooner than a nine iron. Bob, I like your confidence. 
I hope it always works just that way for you on the tour. Thank you, Dow. If there's anything to be learned from playing from sand traps, the fellow to teach it is standing right beside me now. Don January, take over. How come I'm the expert all of a sudden? All of a sudden, it's not. This may go back some ten years, Don. You and I were playing on the tour one of our first or second years, I believe. Doug Ford and I were leading you by a stroke going to the last hole of the Dallas Open, and you had a tremendous drive that ended up in a trap just to the left of the green. Well, what happened is history. Don hold this shot for an eagle two to win the championship by one stroke. Well, that was a lucky break. You know that it was more than luck. Why don't you give us some tips that worked for you then, and again recently, when you won the Philadelphia Classic? Well, first of all, since you're going to be in a trap sooner or later, be prepared by carrying a sand wedge. It is slightly more loft than a pitching wedge, but more important, it has a heavy sole or wide flange on the bottom, which will enable the club to bounce a ride through the sand. It won't dig in. And how do you make that sand wedge work for you best? For a normal trap shot, and if I've got a fairly good lie, I would open up my stance, plant my feet firmly in the sand, and play the ball almost off my left heel. My hands would be slightly forward. I aim approximately two inches behind the ball when playing out of a bunker. Doesn't this vary according to the type of sand? It sure does, Dow. That two-inch rule is for when the sand is fairly loose. If the sand is what we call dirty has a lot of dirt in it, you aim about an inch behind the ball. In cases where the sand is coarse, maybe even wet, you might aim no more than a half to three-quarter inch behind the ball. Okay, so it's normal sand, and I'm aiming two inches behind the ball. Now what? Keep your eyes glued to a spot behind the ball. Pick out a pebble or something and keep your eye there. Don't look at the ball. Now the key to success from this point on is to keep the swing moving. Keep it smooth and give it quite a bit of hand action. Come down and hit behind the ball approximately two inches and keep the club moving. You must make a smooth follow-through in a trap. Most people just tend to lash at it. They'll hit the sand and the club stops and the ball moves maybe a foot or two. Don't ever quit in a trap shot. Don, what if you're in a fairway trap? Let's say maybe 100 or even 150 yards from the green. If there's no huge lip in front of you, you can take a normal iron and employ a normal swing. However, in this case, you must make contact with the ball first. You can't ever hit the sand first and expect to get a long distance out of the shot. If there is a big yawning lip on the trap, you must sacrifice distance and use a club that will give you the height you need to clear the lip of the trap. In a trap by the green, suppose the ball is buried. What then? I cry. Oh, me too. But now what? I'll turn the face of the club in. Close it. Play the ball just about in the center of the stance. Give it a full swing. The ball will come out and will have a lot of run on it. You can't control it too much, but at least the ball will get out and onto the green. It's surprising how easy the ball does come out when you tow the face of the club in. There again, though, you've got to keep the club moving. You can't just hack at it and stop. What if you want to make a ball stop very quickly with that extra backspin? Well, that's a special shot. First, I lay the face of the club wide open, so the club is turned way to the right of the target. Then the ball is played forward off the left heel or even the left toe. The club is taken back outside the line of flight, and you cut right across it, from the outside in, hitting the sand an inch or two behind the ball. That will make the ball rise straight out of the trap and come down with a great deal of backspin. That's a shot that takes a lot of practice, but then I guess that's the name of the game, practice. Don, before you go, maybe you'd like to say something about putting out of a trap. Yes, if the trap is very flat and up next to the green, you can use your putter or even chip it out. But if you're going to do that, you must make sure and contact the ball first, not the sand. <laughs> well, now I know how you beat me, and I'll try not to let it happen again. Okay, Dow. Good luck to both of us. During the year, there are some kinds of trouble shots that you have to make that have nothing to do with the course or the way you play, but do have a lot to do with the weather. Ray Floyd is one of the best when it comes to playing in foul weather. I know because I've played with him in the Bing Crosby National Pro Amateur at Pebble Beach, and any kind of weather is possible there. We've both seen the rain coming at you sideways to such an extent that it made one little 120-yard hole almost impossible. What do you do in a situation like that, Ray? 
punt. <laughs> Boy, I wish I could have. Actually, whenever weather conditions are bad, I take very few chances. This is not a time to be daring. I try to shorten my swing just a little and narrow my stance when it's raining and play it safe. Of course, sometimes in the rain you can hit bolder shots to the green because the ground will be soaked and will hold the ball. Any other rain tips? Yes, I'd say that when the grass is long and wet, there's a tendency for the club face to close and the ball to fly. A firm grip is important. Maybe even a little more right hand just before striking the ball to keep the club face square. And, of course, you want to try to keep your grip and the surface of your club dry as possible. Any water on the club will tend to do all sorts of silly things with the ball. Let's talk about wind for a minute, Ray. What do you do when playing into a headwind? Normally on a tee shot, I try to keep the ball a little lower. I may shorten my swing. And above all, I concentrate on making solid contact. This is not a good time to hook or slice. Why is that, Ray? Because the wind will tend to exaggerate the hook or the slice and make it curve more than it normally would. Is this a factor when you're going downwind also? It certainly is. Downwind is no time to hook or slice either because the wind will tend to straighten the shot. When the wind is behind me, I also tee the ball a little bit higher and move it perhaps an inch or two forward of my normal position. You need more elevation on this shot to get added distance. Hitting irons to the green when you have a falling wind is a much more difficult problem because the ball will tend to have more roll than it normally would. Okay, so what's the answer? You have to play more of an English shot which hits and rolls onto the green. The English have perfected this pitch and run game because of the conditions over there. They have unwatered greens and fairways, so when it's dry, the ball really scoots. Well, then how about this problem, Ray? The ball stops in the middle of the fairway. Everything's looking rosy. Then there's a big glob of mud on one side of the ball. Dow, that's exasperating, and there's really not much you can do about it. The rules won't let you touch it, and when you hit a ball that has mud on it, it's completely unpredictable. It may go right, left, straight up, or it may nosedive as soon as you hit it. Here's another instance when I don't take chances. I try to hit as square as possible and aim for the center of the fairway or the center of the green because you just can't tell what may happen to the ball. Many times, Ray, we have to play in weather that is quite cold. Do you vary your equipment in cold weather? Now I do. When it's very cold, I'll use a golf ball that has much less compression than I do on a warm day. When it's warm, your muscles are a little looser, you can hit a little harder, and because of the nature of the air itself, the ball will fly just a bit further. This allows the use of higher compression ball. Actually, the average golfer can consult his professional and find out what ball he recommends as far as compression. Well, that's a good idea, Ray. We sure appreciate your thoughts on playing in foul weather. We're at the Upper Montclair Country Club in Montclair, New Jersey, where Mason Rudolph won the Thunderbird Classic. Mason, anyone who can chip as well as you did to within six inches of the pin on the 14th hole is certainly qualified to give us our tips on chipping. You're pretty deadly around the green yourself, Dow. Well, if we could all just chip up for a gimme every time, we'd sure save ourselves a lot of shots. What are some of the important things you think about when you are about to play a chip shot? Let's start with the stance, first of all. I use an open stance with most of my weight on my left leg. My feet may be five or six inches apart and the ball about off my right toe. Are we talking about one particular club? That's going to vary, Dow. It could be a five, six, seven iron right through to a wedge, depending on how much run I need to the flag. That's an important point. I think a good many weekend golfers stick to the same club all the time, and it's not necessarily the right club for the situation. Now, how do you handle the chip shot? For one thing, when I address the ball, I keep my hands pretty well ahead of the club head. My head is going to have to be very steady, and there will be practically no body action. It's mostly hands and arms. How about wrist action? I don't use a lot. I cock the wrist a little going back, but keep the left wrist moving as I come into the shot. I see people who attempt a chip shot that's fairly easy, but they allow the right hand to come through and overpower the shot and really flub it. The main thing with a chip is to land on the green, not bounce it on the fringe and then have it come off. That's right. 
Although there are occasions when the pin is very tight, where you might have to bounce it on the fringe once in order to stop it by the hole. Now, let's talk some more about club selection for just a minute. Basically, you want to use a club with the least loft that will allow the ball to land within 6 to 10 feet of the edge of the green and roll the rest of the way. How do you feel about the margin of error in a lofted club as opposed to a straight face club? There's definitely more error with a lofted club than with a straight face club. You can take a 5 or 6 iron and top it or hit behind it, and the ball will still move toward the cup. And if you hit a five iron well, it can be very accurate. With a nine or wedge, well, a dub's a dub. In other words, Mace, the percentages are on your side when you stick with a straight face club, and don't try to be a hero with a wedge. Of course, like with everything else, you can't make a flat rule. If you run into long grass just off the fringe of the green, you're going to have to take a lofted club and preferably the heaviest one in your bag. Boy, now we're talking about one of the hardest shots in the game, Mays. I agree. You just know that the ball is going to come out of the long grass and really roll. So I take the sand wedge because it will do the best job of cutting grass and getting the ball up into the air. Do you play the hands forward as with other chip shots? Yes. The weight toward the left leg, open stance, with the ball just about in the middle. Many times, too, I won't ground the club. I'll hold it above the grass, behind the ball, so it won't get caught as I take the backswing. That seems to work best for me. Mace, whatever you're doing, it must be right, judging from your fine record here at the Thunderbird. Thanks, Dow. Billy Casper's record shows that he has taken many, many championships, including two U.S. Opens. As anyone who has watched him play will testify, Bill is a great player from tee to green but he also must be rated as one of the finest putters of all time. Billy, is there any one putt that stands out in your memory above all others? I think uh, the putt that I had probably a year or so ago in winning the Desert Classic in Palm Springs, the three-foot putt that I left myself on the 72nd hole to win the golf tournament. Uh, President Eisenhower referred to it a little later on as a knee knocker, and I can guarantee you it was a knee knocker. I remember watching that on TV. Tell you another occasion that I remember, the 1965 Sahara Invitational when you played 72 holes and used only 112 putts to set a tournament record of 269. Confidentially, just how'd you do that? Well, Dal, uh, I had been putting very poorly for quite some time, and uh, I tried a new putter, one that I had tried earlier in the year, and I finally found a one that was similar that resembled a tire iron, and a friend of mine called it a railroad tie also, which I putted with during the, the tournament, and uh, as you can tell, I had quite good results that week. You certainly did. Bill, why don't we take a moment now and discuss the various kind of putters that players might employ. Some of the most popular putters are the center-shafted putter and uh, the mallet putter, and right now I am using a mallet putter, but I have had good results with center-shafted putters as well as blade putters. Uh, I think that you should try to get a putter that has a good, firm shaft in it. Good. Now, how about a few pointers on the stance? Well, I think, Dal, it's very important that you assume a comfortable position over the ball. Uh, stance really doesn't make too much difference whether you use an open stance or a closed stance. I have used, uh, in recent years, a wide, closed stance. Do you make any adjustments in your grip? The grip that I use is a reverse overlap, and that's where I place my entire right hand on the grip of the club. And uh, in placing the left hand on, I extend the forefinger down over the last three fingers of the right hand. The right hand is the power hand, but it's very important that the left hand is moved through the ball so that you keep the face of the club square to the intended line. Billy, there are two schools of thought in putting that are widely used. One, the uh, tap or actually just the stroking of the putt. Uh, which one do you recommend? Well, Dow, I use both of them, as you know. Uh, on the longer putts, you have to generate more power, so there must be more follow-through. Uh, and this is more of a stroke on your shorter putts, because we play on a lot of greens that are rather bumpy. And I've adopted a sort of a tap stroke, whereby I start in a strong position with my hands over the ball or slightly in front of it, and then I use a a rather long backswing with a very short follow through it appears like I jab my putts but actually the putter is carried through the ball about two or three inches this causes the ball to 
take overspin, and it will run over all these little bumps that we have in the greens most of the time. Bill, when you get those 20 and 30 foot putts, uh, do you try to make those putts, or are you more concerned at this point of having the ball die around the hole where you can uh, kind of have a tap in? I try to get the ball as close to the hole as I possibly can on any putt that is over 10 or 15 feet. I very rarely try to make a putt, but uh, I just try to get it close to the hole so that I'm assured of making the next putt and eliminating the three putt. By taking your stance and positioning yourself over the ball, you've got the line, so therefore you can forget about the line, but then just concentrate on the speed of the putt and distance that you have to hit the putt. Bill, uh, do you have any tips for practice you might want to give us? Well, I think it's very important that uh, people that are going out to the golf course to play a round of golf devote a little time to hitting balls before they tee off. This will eliminate high scores on the first few holes. Is there any tip on practice putting? Yes, Dal. I think that uh, in practicing putting, you should probably devote about three times as much of your practice time to putting the short putts because you have about three times as many in a round of golf. Well, I'm sure all of the men who have helped us with this record would agree, Billy, that there is no substitute for practice on the green or on the tee. Thank you, Billy, for taking time to be with us. And since you're the last one to come off the course, my thank yous are really intended for all the pros who have shared their playing tips with us. Happy golfing.